Hi, good morning and welcome to the ZP Developer Zone. So we do this um, webinar every um, Thursday at 8am London time. We don't expect people to watch live because uh, many of you are recording across the globe, obviously from essentially from Australia to California. Um, but um, that said, um, we do it every Thursday. It's recorded, it's left up on YouTube and I will essentially um, jump into it now. There's always a lot to be said. Um, and so let me do the first slide. So the first slide, I will show this. We do have the ZP Academy. I'm glad to see some um, new signees up. We do do webinars. We do webinars every um, Thursday at um, 8 a.m. London time. We also do a blog and a vlog. Sorry, a, a, a vlog and a podcast on Sundays at um, 8 a.m. London time. We also do webinars specifically for universities. We haven't done one in a while, and it's really because it's been the summer. But I'm sure the season will kind of come around again and we'll be doing that. Um, we also do collaborations and we also offer jobs and we also have our developers own website. It's probably worth saying that uh, the background behind me today is a little bit different uh, because we're at a conference um, or an expo in Germany. Now we also do provide workshops and we have a workshop coming up um, in, se in September. Um, it's happening in mid-September um, and it's on CGM and wearable biosensors. So we do have um, workshops as well. So topics today are, it's a real mixed bag, um, a glossary of terms of biosensors. So we do get a lot of inquiries about biosensors and people ask questions like, what's the resolution? Um, what's the accuracy? Um, what's the specificity? What's the selectivity? And I think that there's not really a kind of common understanding of of what these terms necessarily mean um so we do have to discuss that today um we did have a inquiry about zp's nanopore technologies and i will um, discuss um, that and we also had a question about how to send ph data to the cloud so i will um, discuss that and first of all glossary so when you're talking about biosensors people often approach us and Sometimes they'll ask us for the sort of characteristics of the sensor. You can use that term here, characteristics or uh, specification. Um, and I should say, say, well, I'll talk about settling time, the time it takes for a sensor to sort of essentially reach its uh, baseline before you can take a measurement. The um, analytical range, the range over which the sensor will work, which is then brings us into limit detection and limit of quantification. Um, biosensor response time, how quickly will, will we respond to a change in concentration. Signal resolution, this is always a really interesting one because people ask us what our resolution is at the same time. There's an entire system at play here. So the sensor can often have good resolution, but at a system level, there's all sorts of noise. Um, the most obvious one is electronic noise. And so the question is actually, what's your resolution? People don't ask us about offset, but I will discuss about offset. Clinical range, um, people ask us, you know, the one question they never, or the one thing they very rarely ask us is, um, can it work within the clinical range? We often ask people, what is the clinical range? And you find out during a course or a project that what people think the clinical range is, is not actually the clinical range. We've got a case at the moment where the signal was expected to be between zero and 10 micromolar. But most of the time, the, I should say signal, I should say the concentration is actually at one micromolar. So we've developed a sensor to work between zero and 10 and 90% of the cases are at one. So it's a real over, let's say kill. And also a, you know, you can develop, if you develop an algorithm that works really well over a range of zero to 10, and most of the numbers are actually at one, you would have been better off to develop and do your uh, develop and characterize more in the zero to one range than to take it all the way out, out to 10. Anyway, so um, we discuss um, clinical range today. Um, also signal drift, this is really important, especially for continuous monitoring applications like CGM and pH. Um, something that nobody ever really uses is um, error grid analysis. Let me, sorry, I just do a quick cough. Error grid analysis is good because what it says is, in fact, I've realized that the error grid analysis is um, 
is actually missing off these slides. But error grid analysis is this that um, in glucose space and glucose applications, we have something called the Clark error grid. And the Clark error grid says you don't always have to be accurate across all of the ranges. Where you have to be accurate in a medical diagnostic is, is those thresholds where you will influence the clinical path. So, for example, if I'm a diabetic, um, then my glucose should be 5 millimolar or 90 mg per dl, depending on the units you use. So it's most important to be accurate at 90 milligrams per dl. Um, and then it's not so important to be accurate at something like um, 180 milligrams per dl because your clinical decisions are not really going to be influenced whether you've got an error up there. If you've got a gross error, that's important. But really, if you read somebody as... Um, 10 millimolar of glucose or you read them at 11 millimolar of glucose you're going to make the same clinical decision either way so being accurate is important and there's different points at which you can have errors and you need to map this out in something called the error grid analysis and nobody does it and the only space that i often see this or it's done is actually the diabetes space with the clark error grid and there's also now a CGM error grid for continuous glucose monitoring. But um, I do encourage clinicians on our, people who get involved with this for biosensor development, they really need to think this through and get the clinicians involved. Something that's really mixed up a lot is specificity versus selectivity. It's an absolute classic. Um, something that I've learned over the years actually is confusion matrix. As, as AI comes along and there's a lot more data scientists in the world, the confusion matrix has come much more to the fore for me. We'll discuss that. And then there's something, it's really old, the receiver operator characteristics, the rock curve. And this is used a lot in medical diagnostics. I don't see it. I've never been taught it at university, it's fine. But I don't think it's actually taught much, out, maybe in some sort of engineering courses, but it's not taught very much. So I'll also discuss um, that today. Right, I will now, um, plow through with it. So settling time. So what do we mean by settling time? So if we have a sensor, um, when we first turn on the sensor, and this is really um, the, the good example of this is a continuous glucose monitor, CGM, and the signal can start high, it can take some time for the signal to essentially reach baseline. And so the settling time for me is the time it takes for the, the apparent signal to get within 90% of, oh, sorry, 10% of the baseline. Otherwise, you could wait forever to really reach a baseline. But the question is, is when am I within 10% of the final baseline? And that's kind of, you know, I would define as, as that's my set, settling time. You can call it T90. So the term T90 is quite well used in engineering. And it's the time that you get within 90% of a final outcome. So settling time, we do have these kind of things in our biosensor world. Um, the classic would be continuous glucose monitoring. When a sensor is first used, it does have to wet up and it can take um, some time. So there's the settling time, but it's very rarely asked about, but it's something you have to be aware of. Range. Um, the range is is really important. And the, and the lower part of the range here is um, really the limit of detection and the limit of quant, um, quantification. And the range of a sensor is really based on the idea that... Um, at least if we talk about the lower limit, if I take um, 10 readings on the identical sample, I can do some analysis on that and I can say, what's my mean and what's my standard deviation? And therefore from that, you can actually determine what your limit of detection is by just doing a simple calculation and going three times the standard deviation would tell me my limit of detection. And a more um, stringent lower parameter would be my limit of quantification, which is 10 times my standard deviation. So if you want to imagine how you would um, at least talk about the lower range of your sensor or your diagnostic, you'd make your sensor or your diagnostic, you test it 10 times with say the same sample, from there you get the mean and standard deviation and your um, limit of quantification or LOQ is 10 times the standard devi deviation, 
no limit detection is three times the standard deviation. So your, your limit detection is lower than your limit of um, quantification. Um, now, sensors have upper ranges. Um, most immunosensors, there's something called the hook effect. So an immunosensor, you can add more and more analyte. For example, at some point, the signal will stop um, changing. This is defined with immunosensors as the hook effect. But it's the same with enzymes as well, that there's a point at which there's not enough enzyme to keep up with the amount of analyte. So there's an upper range, and the upper range is often um, proportional to how much um, molecule or detection molecule I have on that sensor. My lower limit detection is often based around my, um, really how well I make that sensor. Um, if I have a very precise manufacturing, then I'll generally end up with a lower limit of detection or a lower limit of um, quantification. Um, so I've sort of touched upon um, um, ranges there. Response time. Um, this is really similar to um, um, settling time. The response time is just this. I'm at baseline of my sensor. I add a um, analyte. Um, at a known concentration, and there's a jump in signal, and it's just really the response time again. This term T90 is the time it takes me to get sort of 90 within 90% or 90 percent of the signal. So there's a final plateau, which is the last 10%. But you know, I, it, sometimes to reach plateau can take a really long time. But actually, you're really just interested in what's it take me to get within 10% uh, of the plateau. So you call it call it T90. So you often say what well, people say, well, what's my T90 time? So your T90 time is really a good way of quantifying your response time. And it's the time it takes you to get within um, the final, to get 90% of the signal or within 10% of the final, let's say, settling signal or plateau signal. Um, resolution. I love this question of resolution. What's the resolution of your sensor? Often, I think the resolution of the sensor is better than the re resolution of the electronics. But a definition of resolution is this, that um, we're measuring pH, for example, and there's some noise on the signal. And what you would do is you would um, measure all these numbers. You would do a mean of them. You'd get the standard deviation of all those numbers. And then you would say that my, um, my re resolution is three times the standard deviation. So if I've got a very um, noisy signal, I'll have a... Ha I'll have a um, I will have a um, high standard deviation, and therefore I need a signal that's three times that standard deviation. So it means I, I need quite a big um, signal or big change in order to resolve it. If my standard devi deviation is very small, I, I, I don't have a lot of noise on my signal, then I can resolve a signal that's actually a lot less. So when people ask us kind of, what's the resolution of your sensor? Well, the sensors intrinsically are quite, have good res have good resolution, and um, often because they're f we first characterize them on real sorry on lab instruments in a very controlled environment, but of course you know sometimes these sensors find themselves onto other people's electronics and there the the noise um, can be a lot higher, but at least I've tried to define here what res um what I kind of mean by resolution the res to resolve a signal the signal has to be greater than three times the standard deviation. So lots of noise, hard to resolve signal, not lots of noise, easy to resolve signal. Um, something that's not asked a lot, but I I want to bring up is offset. This happens a lot in iron selective electrodes where you can have electrodes that respond perfectly well in their sort of sensitivity to an analyte so analyte concentration changes, sensor changes, signal changes, you know, and they work perfectly well. But there's an offset. It's an offset is really the, I could call it the baseline, in fact, every year in this point. But the baseline is actually a variable. And in particular, on iron selective electrodes, it's really hard to, um, I think it's almost intrinsic to the sensors themselves to have a reproducible baseline. You can take... And this is why when you go into a lab and somebody has a pH meter in the lab, there's always calibration solutions next to it. And it's really because um, the baseline, I think in part, is because the baseline of these 
pH electrodes, which is happen to be ion selective electrodes, um, is very um, up and down, it's, um, and therefore you need to calibrate just before use, just to kind of know where your baseline is at that moment in time. So um, offset is not often discussed, but it is um, something that we have to think about, especially in ion selective electrodes. This is the most confusing or confused terms around specificity and selectivity. Um, I think I get, I come from the world of chemistry as well, and we we have we have we have the same terms, but different context um, in world of chemistry, in terms of we can talk about a reaction being selective and or specific. But specific really means, if I'm trying to make a sensor for glucose, how well can I detect just glucose? Whereas selective says, I've got a mixture of glucose, fructose, and lactose, and maltose. Among all that mixture, how well can I detect the glucose within that mixture? So specificity often just means my focus is on um, that analyte of interest. And I'm almost... I don't want to say ignoring the fact that there are other interferences or other molecules in that um, in that matrix, whereas selectivity kind of really sort of says, look, I understand that there are other interferences, and so I want to know within the context of those other interferences how good my sensor is. So I think you know you can make a glucose sensor that is really specific when used in blood. But actually, if you then try to use it in blood plus acetaminophen, it would get really confused because now it's um, it's got a selectivity issue that acetaminophen is also um, interfering with it. I think when we get to the confusion matrix, which is slightly another slide, I think there's a, a good definition of specificity and selectivity there. So let me um, let me go forward um, a little bit. And here's the confusion matrix. I really like the confusion matrix. Um, the confusion matrix is something that we use at Zimmer and Peacock, and I think it became, I saw a lot of people using it during the COVID-19 crisis, because during COVID-19, um, the way those diagnostics work often is, um, they can be, you know, people used um, RT-PCR to um, do COVID-19 diagnosis. And therefore, you know, you had both a diagnosis, whether the person, patient was positive or negative, but you could also get a quantification as to how many sort of RNA copies were, were in that person. But most of the time, people just want to know whether you're positive or negative. So imagine yourself, you've made a COVID-19 sensor, you think it's great, and then somebody gives you um, 10 samples, and uh, you know whether they're positive or negative. So you test the first sample, and um, it's you know it's positive and it comes back as a positive. So therefore you call that a true positive. So you can put it in the sort of true positive bucket. The next sample that comes to you, you know you know it's a negative. The sensor says it's a negative and therefore you can you can define that as a true negative. So you put it in the true negative bucket. You then get another sample and actually the person is positive. Um, you use the sensor, but the sensor has an error and you end up with a false um, negative. So in fact, the person was a, um, they had the disease, you test them on the sensor, the sensor said they didn't have the disease, therefore they're a false negative. Now you get next um, sample is from a healthy person. Um, you test their sample on sensor and the sensor says, oh, they got the disease. That's a false positive. So it's, I think it's actually quite interesting because it's a very simple procedure the procedure kind of relies on you knowing the truth, whether they really are positive or negative, and you just keep on putting them into these buckets. Was the sensor right? That's a true positive. Was the sensor right, but the person didn't have the disease? That's a true negative. Was the person disease-free, but you read it as they did? Then that's a false positive. Or did the person, in fact, have the disease? Um, in fact, you read it as a negative. And this kind of means that you can you can play with your assay and also your ability to accept risk because sometimes getting um, false negatives um, or false positives could be really important or not so important. So I'll, let me just say something that in order the, the minimum threshold for an assay to be clinically useful is to have a 70% accuracy. 
Now, clinicians always work much, much better than that. But the kind of rule of thumb is if you're to be useful, you, you've got to have a minimum threshold of 70%. If you're not, if you're below that, then you're really not that useful. So I find the confusion matrix quite useful, actually, because from the confusion matrix, you can take all your um, the number of true positives, divide it by the sum of the true positives and false negatives, and that will tell you your sensitivity. So sensitivity was that um, sensitivity then is therefore, I know I've said it already, but it's the numerator's number of true positives over the denominator, which is the sum of true positives and false negatives. And that will give you your kind of sensitivity. So when people talk about sensitivity for a COVID-19 sensor, this is possibly the way they went about um, doing it. Um, I also quite like um, the specificity, which is really um, how many true negatives over the sum of true negatives plus um, false positives. So there's a good um, sensitivity, is good definition of specificity there. Um, precision, which is true positives uh, over the, uh, just wanna, oops, a daisy. Uh, yeah, sorry, which is, um, which is um, true precision is true positives over um, some of true positives is false positives. And then accuracy, and this is the one where I say, you've got to have a minimum of like 70% accuracy. So it's the sum of true positives plus true negatives um, over, um, over um, the, I'm just trying to try, drag my, drag my um, image out of the way so you can actually see that over true negative plus false negative or plus true positive plus um, false positive. Um, and I find uh, this, the process is quite straightforward, but you actually get quite powerful mate metrics out of this. And so when you ask, you know, when people say, oh, you know, I think COVID-19 assays in the end were getting, they were above 90%. And I think that some governments were asking for 95%. So therefore, it was actually this calculation from a confusion matrix, and I'm sorry, I'm going to cough again, which is how they were um, actually calculating that. Um, which is kind of interesting, actually, because people ask us, what's the accuracy of a sensor? And really, the question is, is what's the accuracy of the sensor in the context of a particular disease, for example? And they probably ne they never mentioned the confusion matrix. Um, but we have discussed accuracy this morning. Um, and I really like the fact that um, you can, from a confusion matrix, you can actually um, generate what's called a rock curve. And the rock curve is a receiver operator characteristic. Now, when you've got a diagnostic and you want to call somebody as diseased or non-diseased, you can have a threshold and you can say, above this threshold, you are a diseased person or below this threshold, you're a non-diseased person. And you can actually play with that threshold and you can end up by playing with that threshold, affecting the rates of true positive, true negative, false positives, false negatives. So you can play with the threshold in order to say, um, in order to kind of essentially increase uh, accuracy or change um, specificity and selectivity because you want to tune your assay using this threshold value um, until really you've got acceptable. Because a lot of diagnostics are used in what's called triaging. And what triaging means is 100 people um, come into my healthcare system and I want to decide efficiently how to, um, how to take care of these people. And so what you, do with, what you do with the diagnostic is you test everyone and if they're positive, they go in one direction. If they're negative, they go in another direction. But there's a rate at which you're going to call it wrong. You're going to get false positives and false negatives. But sometimes it's not terrible. When you get a false positive, false negative, it just means you're going to reassess that person. So you have to accept some error in life. And the question is, how much error are you willing to accept and still for that diagnostic to actually be useful? And these are definitely not the questions that um, come to Zimmer and Pico. People come to us from almost like an engineering perspective. I need this. But actually, what you what you really need is in the context of what's actually going to happen with the data. What's the healthcare system going to do with the data? Or what's the clinician um, actually going to do with the data as well? Uh, now, 
if you have an excellent diagnostic and everyone wants excellent, then the difference between diseased and non-diseased signals is so big, you know, it's quite easy to sort of, um, quite easy to use that diagnostic. But in life, um, you know, there's sometimes um, a gray area between whether the diagnostic is calling somebody as healthy or, or diseased or non-diseased, and there, there can actually be a, um, there could be a bit of an overlap. And so, but it can still be a good diagnostic. There is a case for useless diagnostics. A useless diagnostic is where you can't distinguish between healthy and non-healthy. Um, and essentially you might as well just guess, you know, and that, and so that there are definitely uh, useless diagnostics and you know, that, that you couldn't go to market. For each, for each of these scenarios, the the rock value, for example, in a, in an in the excellent diagnostic that I've shown you, is the idea that in fact the area under that curve is like um, 0.98. Perfect is one. Um, excellent is 0.98, for example. Good is 0.8. So um, you know, if 80% of the time you're getting the signal right, it's considered good. Useless is you know really 60% and lower and would be considered um, pretty useless. Something that's never talked about or never asked about is drift. Drift is um, biosensors and in vitro diagnostics are kind of interesting from other sensor classes because actually they're in contact, they're in, um, they're in the sample, they're intrinsically in attached to the sample. So we have a lot more problems with drift. So for example, a temperature sensor is often very isolated from the sample. You know, so in fact, its drift is less of a problem. But with us, you know, if you put a sensor in blood, the signal will drift. The blood itself is changing. Blood is active. So you will get drift. Um, it's not very rarely talked about, but it is um, the elephant in the corner when it comes to the sensing. I'm actually going to change. I'm just looking at the time. It's 8.29. This is 29 minutes into this, and I'm only on um, the first sort of point. So let me go a little bit quicker now and just talk about um, nanopores. So somebody was asking us about the ZP technology around nanopores and is it better? Better is a strong term. So for example, if you're an end user and you want to do what's called next generation sequencing, then one of the technologies that are out there is, this is an image from Oxford Nanopore. This is their um, product. Oxford Nanopore is a company that has easily had an excess of over 500 million um, US dollars. Um, and they have a next generation sequencer based on a um, nanopore technology. So now is ZIMP got better than um, Oxford Nanopore? It really depends on the context. If you're an end user and all you want are numbers, or sorry, you want sequences, um, sequences then Oxford Nanopore for you. If you're a developer, or very much in academia and you want to develop technologies around um, nanopores, then what ZP has is better because ours is essentially open in terms of we have the components necessary to make these kind of technologies from the ground up. Whereas Oxford Nanopore have invested, you know, hundreds of millions in making a perfect, essentially, you know, I don't want to say perfect, but they're making a very good product for doing a specific um, job. So if you're an end user, you have to go with Oxford Nanopore. If you're a developer, um, then you probably have to go with something like ZP. Um, I just want to reference this paper because I'm going to use um, some of their material. I want to make sure that you understand where I got this material from. Um, I mean, how these um, nanopores are working is this, that you have essentially two chambers that are separated by um, a membrane. And in that membrane is we call it a nanopore. I mean, it's just a hole, but it's a hole on the same kind of dimensions as, um, for example, a single strand of DNA. Now, as the DNA comes through, the DNA has got bases, it's got A, T, G, and C, and the transition of each base through that hole um, affects the flow of current. So we have two chambers separated by a membrane. There's a hole in the membrane, and we're applying quite a large, well, we're applying a voltage either side of the membrane. So when you apply voltage through a hole, you're essentially applying voltage across a resistor. So we have a resistance, but as things go through the hole, the resistance changes. And because the hole is on a similar dimension 
as as to these bases which are you know make up um, DNA A T G and C because the whole is on a similar dimension the whole is sensitive to the um, to the structure of those bases and so it shows a um, they call it impedance but it's a resistance change that's actually indicative of the base that's actually undergoing the transition so a um, adenine has a certain signal thymine has a sig certain signal guanine has a certain signal um, cytosine has a certain signal and so what what oxo nanopore are doing is they've automated all of this and so you're not exposed to raw signal they just give you the um the bases you know they reconstruct um the sequence for you now but at zimmer and peacock you know are we better and again the word better is it depends what you're looking for if you're looking for an end person solution i would recommend oxford nanopore if you're a developer or an academic and you're trying to make new nuanced or further this the field then you're better off um, buying components so as i say the the dna goes through the essentially through the pore which i think is really a hole and you get these signals as each um base for example in the sequence um, transitions through that hole and that's what oxford is doing and they've automated it made it beautiful with zp you end up with a raw signal and you have to do all the hard work uh, yourself um, and we do have these kind of technologies on our um, website. But again, recommendation Oxford Nanopore if you're an end user, like a biologist. Um, and if you're a developer, then buying components and building your own system is perfectly fine. Just lastly, um, pH to um, API. So what's the most measured chemical um, parameter in the world? It's probably um, pH. So pH to API for Zimmer Pigot means somebody wants to make a ph measurement they have a new application and they actually want to get the data into the cloud so i will describe an api stands for application programming interface so i will sort of describe that now as a zp we have a whole bunch of sensors um, one of the most um, popular is ph as i say it's probably one of the most measured chemical parameters in the world um, if you're just new to zp then i would recommend um, ZP's um, hypervalue pH sensor um, but I know many people actually want to develop their own pH sensor so there's a couple of, sort of design rules around um, this if you want to be compatible with our um, pH to API workflow it's probably good to be what's called an iron selective electrode um, and we do have some dimensions on our website so as long as you're building to our dimensions um, for example, these electrical contacts here, then you can essentially fit into our platform. So our um, the whole idea is that somebody wants to make a pH measurement um, and actually we want to get the data to the cloud because once you've got the data to the cloud, we can really troubleshoot and refine the product. And then that's what we, we're trying to do. So we have um, at Zimmer and Pico, we have hardware that clips into an Android phone the sensor goes into that. So you're either using our pH sensor or you're using one that you developed um, yourself. Of course, I prefer our pH sensor, but I know that some of the people I'm talking to um, are very interested in developing their own pH sensors. Um, there's an app that comes with this. And what the app does is it makes a, um, it runs a potentiometric measurement um, and then you are able to upload that data to the cloud. But what's nice is, you can put in a sample ID here um, and the sample ID and the data will make its way to the cloud. So you'll, you'll let your lay basically, you know where your data is because it's in your cloud account and you'll be able to sort of find it because you've got the um, ID in there. Now, because that data is in the cloud, we can put it through a, um, a calibration factor and actually give you back pH. But the the pH that you measure, you, you could have the same pH in blood, urine, sweat, but actually the calibration required for blood, urine, and sweat is actually different. And this is when it becomes really powerful because actually you can end up, now that you have all your data in the cloud, you can start tuning that calibration factor to go from raw signal to information or the potentiometric data to pH value. You can start tuning that in the cloud now and actually um, make a more accurate um, final measurement. Now I say this is um, pH to API because we also have an API strategy at Zimmer and Peacock. So for example, 
Um, you could imagine yourself, I'm a developer of a pH sensing technology. I want to measure pH in blood. Um, you can use this whole platform to get the raw data to the cloud. Um, you could turn it into pH and you can actually call it across to your cloud using what's called an API. So we have a proprietary database called Julie. Um, Julie has um, an API um, button on it. And if you click that, then it allows you to use tokens to authenticate yourself and you can actually make a call upon our database and bring the data across to um, your database and that's what we mean by ap sorry and um, ph to api so if i was to summarize that then ph is a very commonly measured um, parameter ph could be measured in the food industry the medical industry the process industry um, we can make a quick measurement on that ph and send that data the raw data to the cloud. There we can convert it into a pH value, but we can also then, because we've got it in the cloud, actually tune that calibration factor to really reflect the application itself. And then if you're a developer that, you know, you're a company, you can have a real user experience because actually you can, you can present the data in your own cloud using what's called um, an API call upon our cloud. Um, and even though I showed the, the use of a, a smartphone there, we do have what's called mesh networks. So you can, you know, if you want to measure pH continuously in a water, in a river, we could also do that. Um, and the products look more like this. And we also have a wearables platform. So if you want to measure, I mean, the classic would be glucose, for example. Um, but you know, we could also potentially talk about pH as well. This is the sensor and this is the electronics. I'm just kind of saying to you, um, there's lots of form factors to have the smartphone, do it in an environmental application or do it in a wearable application. So we do have all of this, but the, the commonality of this is we're able to get all the data to our cloud and then you can pull it across using um, an API call upon us. These are just some useful links I'm going to put underneath the video um, when I finish this. I realize it's 8.39, so I so apologize for um, running over like this. Topics today. We did a lot. There was a glossary of biosense terms. Um, we did um, also discuss um, how nanopores work, and we also discussed our, um, our workflow of able to get pH data, including the raw data to the cloud. In the cloud, we could turn it into raw data back into information like the pH value, but also that data doesn't have to remain locked in our cloud. You can call it across to your application using um, an API call. So I thank you very much for your um, patience today. Um, if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to reach out to us at um, Zimmer Peacock. Otherwise, I do wish you a good day. Um, and as I say, any questions, um, don't hesitate to reach out. And we will speak to some of you soon um, during the week. All right. Cheers. Take care. Bye bye.